We always say, like, you know, have all your points completely separate, you know, a, a, a new paragraph for supporting arguments. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's not really how you write a story, right? You know, if you write a personal essay like that, you know, if you talk about, like, racism and how, how you as an individual went through racism, you talk about, like, you know, verbal racism and, you know, implicit racism and you, you separate all these things. There's really no flow. There's really no sort of motivation for a reader to spend their time, you know, which is sort of a precious commodity, right? You're asking for the reader for their time. And there's no, there's no reason for a reader to engage with you if, if that's how you're presenting what you're trying to say, right? So even though your personal essay should have these tenets, it shouldn't be separate. You know, you should be able to flow in from one argument to another, refer back to arguments, refer back to your thesis or, or your intro or your conclusion. And they should all sort of gel together in a way that a story does and an essay often doesn't. Yeah, essays are usually not, are tend to be very dull <laughs> and uh, very, uh, right. Be right. not stories, there's, there's right. uh, propositions or whatever <laughs> yeah and no and nobody wants to read anything dull you know the only reason you would ever read something dull is if you had to right mm -hmm. so so the the intro that i picked out was uh you know the intro from from the reading which was um yeah uh, i want to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. right yes i read that and, <laughs> yeah and what i really like about it is okay well i'll get into why i like it but it's, it's quite compelling, the opening sort of sentence here, the best job I ever had, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, she doesn't bother telling you all the things that sort of are not relevant to the piece, right? So like her childhood, her education, you know, her experiences, like you don't need to know any of that. She drops you right into like, okay, this is the best job I ever had and I'm right in the middle of it, right? You don't need anything outside of 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 the story that you're telling, and, and and that's what makes it so compelling, right? When you read that, you're like, okay, as soon as I read that, I'm in the middle of the story, and she's taking me on a journey. You know, I don't have to read through a bunch of paragraphs um, to to get to where we want to be. We're we're already there with the first sentence. Um, and so that's what I think a, a powerful intro does, right? So the, so the first tenet of a strong intro is that it establishes point of view. And this one really does just simply by using the uh, pronoun I, you know, all right, it's in her point of view. Mm -hmm. She is the main character. And, you know, this is how the story is going to be told. The second thing is established topic. Right. So this, she doesn't talk about the uh, about Salman Rushdie uh, and sort of how uh, the discourse around uh, Muslim Canadians uh, sort of changed. And that's sort of the, the overarching theme of the piece. Mm -hmm. But this was submitted for a like journalism co personal essay competition. And so it's it would be weird if it if she tried to do that immediately. It wouldn't fit like sort of the theme of the converse, uh, of the uh, of the competition. But um, so yeah, she doesn't really establish the topic in the first opening paragraphs, which is fine, right? Like as I said before, um, we're not trying to follow a model of a personal essay. We're trying to tell the story the way it should be told. Um, and then three and four are sort of similar. You have to hold interest. And you have to show off technique, you know, because statistically about 90% of readers when they're reading a long piece or anything above sort of 500 words, they'll only get to the end of uh, the first paragraph, right? So 
it's so important realistically you know you can have a, a, a brilliant structure for an essay but if your writing is boring you know if your writing doesn't have sort of life and mm -hmm. and feel then readers are going to stop even if you have the most poignant thing to say people are going to stop reading um and that's why it's so important to to establish your style early you know and with the example uh of i want to be part of the conversation she immediately throws in a lot of details that'll hook you in right so when you're reading this she has so many like uh sort of specific nouns that like you can you can automatically picture what she's saying in that unadorned boardroom sitting on chairs perched on tables coffee cups pens papers newspaper clippings books right these are things that you know sort of trigger mental images you know and once you have those mental images you can you're you're more able to use the empathetic side of your brain and, and put yourself there and uh, and that's sort of her style right like she likes to list things she likes to move quickly and and you're already sort of familiar with how the rest of the piece is going to be and it's at this point where like if you sort of enjoying her her specific style then then you're going to read the rest of the piece right if if the intro is generic then you've already you're going to lose every reader that you have you know um because the, if the story is about you then the writing should be you as well it shouldn't be you know trite shouldn't have cliches it it, it should be like the, the writing itself you know the, the word choice the cadence the rhythm should also represent who you are and and i think she does that pretty effectively um so this is an exercise that i i, I did uh just by myself which is like i'm gonna pretend i'm writing a personal essay about the day i had today you know and I'm trying to do. I'm trying to accomplish these four things. I'm trying to establish my point of view, which is easy with a personal essay because as soon as you use the word "I," you've done that. You know, establish the topic, hold interest, and show off my style, right? And so when I put try to put these four things together, I wrote this paragraph. <laughs> Don't consider myself awake the moment I open my eyes nor when the haze of unconsciousness begins to clear. I'm awake when I hear my coffee machine whir, the exact point at which the sunbeam stops sounding like rain on a glass ceiling and more like small rocks being dropped into a Folgers ocean. <laughs> when the rumbling boiling point of tap water turns into a meek wheeze. It is at this moment, and only this moment, where I have the wherewithal to check my emails and clear my voicemail. And on this particular November morning, I mutter to myself, I need a new goddamn coffee machine. <laughs> wow. so this was the, in, in in theory you know this would be the intro to the rest of my uh rest of my piece and so what i'm trying to do is okay i use i statements um i establish you know this is i've woken up this is my day um and then I'm sure showing off my technique, right? You, you gotta like, show off a little bit and you know, just like quirks that I have in my writing, I'm just gonna let come out, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I like, you know, subverting expectations and, and, you know, so I try to make the reader think that I'm gonna uh, like say, oh man, I love taking in these sites and, and this, that's what this intro is about. But this intro is actually about how bad my coffee machine is, and just that you know, subverting is is how I like to write. You know, it's just personally, you know, how my brain sort of just finishes thoughts. So, so that's why I did that. It's really well written. I love the word "got down" use of that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I love words like that too. It it builds a lot of rhythm yes. in your sentence. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, yeah, it makes the sentence just like long enough, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, it, I, I like it. Yeah. But, um, and so yeah, that's the intro. But at the end of the day, you're not really writing 
to write an intro, right? You're writing because you have a, a grander point in mind, right? And that's got to be the thesis. So, so what I always say is like, when you're, when I'm writing a personal essay, it's easy to start writing a blog or a diary entry, you know? And so what that means is a diary entry is like, it's just stream of consciousness, right? Like you're just writing whatever comes to mind. You're writing your feelings, you know? And, you know, that's great that you can, you know, try to like formulate your feelings into, into words, but doing that ultimately doesn't service the grander point, right? Like the example of like, if I'm writing about, you know, racism in Canada, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that like, I felt sad or I felt angry, you know, that like, that'll inform how the piece is written, but my feeling that isn't actually all that important. Um, it, it, at least it's not important to the thesis. The thesis should be sort of, you know, a bird's eye view of it. It should be like, you know, why is this happening? Why did this happen? How did this happen? What were the sort of institutions in place that caused it to happen? Right? And the best way to make sure that that comes through in writing, I think, is to just think about, it's, think about all the questions that start with why. Like, like um, uh, why am I writing this? why is this important and why should the reader listen to me you know with a personal essay uh the third one like why should they listen to me is sort of self-explanatory because it happened to me you know or else it wouldn't be a personal essay it would be you know just an article about somebody else um so in a personal essay the first two are actually the things that require the most thought like, why am i writing this and why is this important so if we think about these questions in terms of the reading, right? Like why, why was I want to be part of the conversation written and why is this important? I, I think, you know, if you don't have answers to these questions before you've written something, then it'll end up looking more like a blog or a diary entry than a personal essay. So, you know, it's, it's not really good practice in the personal essay, obviously, to uh, just present a thesis, just, you know, as if you're writing a scientific paper or something like that. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of work in a personal essay to identify the thesis. And most of the time, the thesis is not explicit. There's no one sentence that is the thesis, but there's sort of going to be a passage where the reader goes like, oh, okay, you know, like, this topic, the, the greater overarching theme is being explained and we're about to explore it, right? So the point at which you know that something's about to be explored, the moment right before is usually where the thesis is hiding. Um, this one, this, this thesis comes out pretty late and that's okay, that this is, it genuinely doesn't matter where, when you make your thesis as uh, explicit as it gets. But, you know, the thesis is ultimately about like, how, you know, the media um, can, can shape our thoughts, you know, and, and be as per pervasive as we know it ended up being, right? Because this was written years ago before, you know, me the media became even as polarized as it is now. Things have really progressed in the last sort of five, ten years. And, uh, and I think this is a pretty powerful thesis, but, but again, you know, she, like it's, it's a personal essay. You're supposed to write in your style. And so you don't need a thesis that, you know, explains your supporting arguments, list them one by one. You, know, you just need to, you just need to have it in your head. And that's the most important part. And, you know, this is sort of another passage that happens earlier in the piece. It sort of says the same thing. Um, and, and that's, I think, the biggest, the biggest hurdle that I find when I read personal essays, um, especially when they're done by people that have never written them before, um, they, they have a hard time with uh, being implicit, right? Like they feel the need to over explain 
and tell readers like this is what I'm talking about you know um, a lot of the time it comes in like a stat like if again going back to the races example like a writer might say like you know 46 percent of racist incidents or this or that and it's like you know that's great to have as a supporting argument but um, you don't want to you don't want to tell tell readers that they're in the wrong if they don't care about an issue, right? You gotta sort of force them to care with the essay. And that's what the purpose of a personal essay is. You know, you're trying to change their minds. You're not supposed to uh, sort of tell them that they're wrong and then explain why, right? It's supposed to sort of be the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and then and the second biggest hurdle is this one. And this is why a lot of personal essays end up being really boring. Uh, and why, you know, personal essay actually used to be a much bigger thing. Um, there's a, a New Yorker writer, Gia Tolentino, who wrote a quick hit about like just how uh, personal essays sort of disappeared for a little bit, you know, like mm. magazines stopped commissioning them, people stopped writing them, the demand for them decreased. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of reasons why, but I think one big reason is that uh, when, when the internet sort of came out, like became the main source of sharing ideas, um, the barrier for like writing a personal essay was no longer uh, limited to people that were really good at them. You know, everyone was writing personal essays, pitching them everywhere, and and they're so for a magazine publication uh they're they're kind of easy right like you don't have to verify all the facts that happened to somebody else because you're speaking directly per to the person that it happened to right so the fact checking is easy it's fast um the copy editing is fast and you can get a piece out a quality piece out pretty fast and fill a, a lot of pages in the magazine and so a lot of uh, magazine publications were commissioning a lot of personal essays and commissioning people that weren't really necessarily good at them or hadn't written that many yet. They were just looking for like, okay, he has a good story. Let's give him a personal essay. You know, she has something interesting that happened to her. Let's give her a personal essay. And the thing that I found most that was missing is, is this point right here, which is that the, the main character of these stories didn't have very much agency, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think this is actually a problem with, uh, with I want to be part of the conversation. It's a, it's a really good personal essay to me, but one thing that is, is really lacking is that like, is, is, you know, how fleshed out the writer is in her own story. You know, she doesn't really make any decisions in the story. She doesn't, you know, uh, like take matters into her own hands. There's no identifiable like problem that happens to her. And I think I, I was going to go over this a lot more uh, next month. Um, but yeah, it's like you you don't when you're watching a movie and there's a main character and things just happen to the main character and the main character doesn't really say or do anything that changes the story. It's, uh, it, it, it's a boring story, you know, it, you, you don't, it, it's a hard to trigger an empathetic response, um, or even a response at all. If you're, it feels like this like lifeless character, you know, um, I, so the way I, I like to describe this point is yeah, think of it like it's, it's a video game, right? Like when you're playing a video game, the character you're playing does things, right? Like they're influencing the story and everybody else does like has pre-written dialogue, you know, they don't impact the story. They're just non-playable characters, right? And so when you're writing a personal essay, you want your main character to be the, a video game character. You don't want them to be, you know, just these like people that, that just stand there and just have things happen to them. Uh, and, and and it's a lot of people, I, a lot of young people, I think, struggle with uh, 
you know, they, they, they like to, they're all very modest, I think, this young generation of people, you know, and they don't like to put themselves in, in, in a spotlight the way I think a personal essay should, right? Um, but, it, but I think, you know, if you're writing about yourself, you sort of need to throw a little bit of modesty away and let yourself sort of, you know, have some agency, you know? make choices, you know, have wants, have needs, you know, get them, make sacrifices, change, you know. I think we're sort of hardwired to enjoy stories of change. And if, if you don't change throughout your story, then it's going to be boring. Mm. And so the last really big part of an essay is obviously your supporting argument. And this is sort of the point where, uh, you know, having gone to journalism school and having a journalism mindset, I think this part is sort of more important to me than it is from both uh, fiction and sort of um, freestyle writers. But, you know, in a personal essay, it's still supposed to be true and accurate. And so uh, if you ever have a fact, it needs to be supported, right? You need statistical, historical, or anecdotal evidence in, in sort of every fact that you state, or else you lose credibility as an author. Um, in personal essays, it's nice because you can rely on anecdotal evidence, and it's the hardest to debunk. It's the hardest to criticize, and it's and, and that's why a lot of uh, people, like unexperienced writers, find it easiest to write uh, personal essays as opposed to doing like, you know, writing a profile about somebody else or writing know a hard-hitting news piece or, or, or a feature or something like that but no matter what sort of uh, supporting argument uh, you want you're trying to back up it needs to be one of these three right so uh, I think in I want to be part of the conversation she she sort of uh, leans on statistical uh, supporting arguments and and that's great but uh, a lot of writers sort of misuse them and you got to be careful about them uh, the simpler your uh, your statistical argument is the less likely you are to have get it wrong or miss nuance in it right and so that's what uh, Kim does here. She just says 3.2% of our population is Muslim. It's her second largest religion. And these are very easily identifiable sort of true facts. You know, uh, the moment she starts using stats like, uh, like this percent of hate crimes are, are targeted towards Muslims, then uh, you start to get into a lot of trouble because now you have to figure out, okay, where did this data come from? Um, what you know? What is defined as a hate crime in the study? And it's and the more layers you have to unpack, the more likely it is that you're missing out on some nuance and your supporting argument sort of fails. Um, and that's why I, I always recommend people like if you need to use a, a, a stat, then just try to find the simplest version of a statistic. Um, but you know. A good writer doesn't only use one. You know, you'll see all three throughout the piece all the time. And that's what this does in the second sort of paragraph here. Use, she uses historical evidence. So it's like, you know, you need a nice balance. If I wrote a, a personal essay where every stat, every uh, fact I have is backed up by a statistic, by a percentage, you know, it's, that's another way it'll be boring. And then I've stopped telling a personal story I no longer have change and now it's just you know some article and I've lost my voice and then it's and then and then the reader stops reading um, another thing about a, a historical argument is that you don't want to step back too far you know like uh, this this passage here I thought was 
you know, it, I, 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 to be honest, I don't think it worked that great, right? The second one here, you know, as soon as she started talking about Athens and democracy, you know, this, this is the same thing as, as I was talking about with like, you know, if you use a complicated stat, and there are a lot of layers to that statistic that you have to unpack and it's easy to get things wrong. It's the same thing for a historical example. If you use a very broad historical example, then then you're making a lot of like sort of strong uh, arguments about a very complex and nuanced topic. And it's easy to exclude a lot of things. And if you read online criticism of, uh, of any sort of article that comes out from the New York Times or the New Yorker or you know, any publication, a lot of the time it's because the author has uh, tried to use a historical example to prove something and experts about that historical example is like, actually, you left out a lot of sort of you know, little nuances and, and aspects of this. And you, you used this historical example to paint a very sort of narrow, uh, narrow picture. And, and it's a lot more complicated than that. Right? Isn't that um, usually the case? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's why, uh, and that's why this is sort of it's weird to me, right? Like uh, Athens as the first democracy, it was like it, there were so many different aspects to it, right? That you can't just say, you know, the, you know, they were, they were problematic and that's it, right? It's like having two sentences to describe all of Athens as a democracy is, uh, it's sort of is is weak. It's I think it's weak writing. But the, you know, you have, sort of have to have supporting arguments. You know, you, it's not something that you can just not have in your piece. But when you have it, you gotta make sure it's strong. So, if we think about you know, if we were writing a personal essay about climate change, for example. A thesis should be as you know, sort of simple and broad as climate change is bad. Like that's the overarching theme. Everything that you write in your personal essay about climate change should service the fact that climate change, you know, is something that we need to combat. And then the supporting argument is sort of how you know you get that point across, right? It's 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 very similar to how you know a high school student would write an essay. But uh, it, it gets a lot more complicated once you have to support these things with uh, your, your the types of supporting arguments. Uh, because this topic is very science heavy, you know, you would expect the supporting arguments to use like the global temperatures, use a, st a statistic for that. Rising sea levels, use a statistic for that. Ha habitat and species loss, you know, probably you would, you would use statistic, um, and just like that, you've used a statistic for all three of these, and then now your writing is really boring. You know, if you described habitat and species lost through your own eyes, like you, maybe you took a trip to the Amazon, and you know, you took this lovely boat tour, and all around you was this like lush canopy of leaves and and wildlife around, but in the distance, you heard like a logging truck, you know, it's like anecdotal evidence like that will go a long way uh, in varying your types of supporting arguments. And it'll make your writing really strong, I think. And so uh, an exercise that I always do is to, is to think of a topic and the life experience that relates, right? Because uh, it's, it's easy to think about statistics that'll back up your argument, but it's a lot harder to think about, you know, trying to prove that topic with a life experience, right? So it can be just like, it can be anything, you know? Uh, like, I can't really, I can't even think of a topic right now, but you, you have to believe me that, uh, <laughs> 